Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, for those who are tuning in when I put this up. I don't know when, but I hope that you'll enjoy it. Uh, today, I am talking with uh, the one and only Andrew McLuhan, the founder of the McLuhan Institute and the grandfather of, or grandson, excuse me, of, of Marshall McLuhan. Um, Andrew, if you could just uh, briefly introduce yourself and let the audience know who you are and what you do. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm uh, Andrew McLuhan, grandfather of Marshall McLuhan, maybe. You know, child is father Sorry. Of the and stuff. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. Um, who am I? Yeah, I'm the founder and director of the McLuhan Institute. I am father of a kid who desperately wants to be in the NHL. Uh, I'm a reformed, somewhat reformed punk rocker and poetry enthusiast. Uh, I talk a lot of shit on Twitter in a polite Canadian kind of way, I think. Um, what else? I also kind of live in a library and have a lot of fun playing with words. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> I, I do enjoy I do enjoy your Twitter account quite much just because you have these just short little sentences that uh, are very reflective, I think, of who you are as a person and also sort of the work that you do. Um, and you had, you had told me over emails, we were going back and forth that you had started this Institute in, in 2017. Yeah. Um, is, is there a particular reason as to why it took so long for such an Institute to happen or that you weren't happy with say those than, uh, you know, the already established academia. I know there's a school named after him, but. That's a very, very, that's a great question. Not to, you know, fluff your feathers or something, but, uh. Nobody has thought to ask that before, <laughs> but it's a great <laughs> question. I, I started the McLuhan Institute because it didn't exist, um, basically. And why it didn't exist is a very interesting thing. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, universities, colleges that have media studies or communication departments. And in a lot of those, you'll find Marshall McLuhan uh, covered in like an introduction to a uh, theory class or whatever. Um, Marsha McLuhan, for all that he did manage to do, uh, did not successfully um, found a school or, or anything really to carry his work forward, um, except for a child. Actually, he had six kids, but my dad was the oldest. Hmm. Uh, and my dad worked with him from the mid 1960s until Marshall died in 1980. And then my dad kind of kept on in this building, really, um, the tradition for, for a few more decades uh, until I came along and got kind of interested in it. Um, but yeah, he, he started something called the Center for Culture and Technology at the University of Toronto. Um, which was briefly renamed the McLuhan Center for Culture and Technology until uh, a family member insisted they remove the McLuhan name. Um, and really, it's actually a kind of sordid story of at, at the end of his life, uh, Marshall McLuhan had a stroke, which um, rendered him unable to speak. Uh, except to say kind of make noises or whatever. He lived the last year and a half of his life like that. Hmm. Um, and he was only uh, 68 years old when that happened. Um, he was expected to recover and learn how to speak again, but he died uh, on New Year's Eve 1980 uh, at 69 years old. Um, and after he had the stroke, basically the university forced him into early retirement and closed the center, Center for Culture and Technology which he was the director of. And the center remained closed for uh, actually not that long, like half a dozen years or something. It reopened, but it was never the same. Um, without Marshall to lead it, uh, it went in different directions, which is natural. But um, there was no, uh, you know, for example, at the U of T, there's Innes College named after Harold Innes. There's no McLuhan College. There's there's a plaque, which hilariously, um, I looked up on Google the other day, and there's a red thing across it that says temporarily closed. Uh, I'm not sure how you temporarily close a plaque, but 
uh, it made me laugh because uh, the university is is a funny and kind of petty place at times. Um, so long story short, there was uh, my dad kind of kept away over the years, continuing the tradition as best he could. Um, when I got interested in it uh, back around 2009, 10, um, there was nothing in place except you know, my dad kind of teaching me this and that. And back around 2017, I decided to start the McLuhan Institute because um, I was afraid that when my dad died, so much died with him. Mm. Uh, and there was nothing in place again to formally keep it going. So I came up with this grand vision for the McLuhan Institute, which would kind of preserve McLuhan studies in the McLuhan tradition and you know, maybe eventually be an actual physical place where people could visit and study and learn and explore. Uh, and that's what I've been doing for the last, um, you know, several years is um, maintaining and trying to build that vision. Well, and it's, it's very rare sometimes for people to carry on a legacy like that is especially an academic one a pioneering field of understanding media not to be too on the nose referencing a text of his but i am curious from your perspective what is the the McLuhan tradition yeah uh it you know if it's it's not rare for McLuhan and sons to continue the shoemaking or auto mechanic or whatever business but it is very rare in an intellectual field to have a generational kind of project. Um, and I'm not sure that's what this is really. Uh, you know, my father was the academic that my grandfather was and that I'm not at all. Uh, I barely graduated high school. Um, I come at this from a very uh, different kind of perspective, which I think, um, I think is my is a strength. Uh, certainly, I lean into it anyway, um, because you know what, academia has had decades to do anything, and all they do is write papers and have conferences. And um, we're not in a much better world than we were when Marshall wrote Understanding Media in '64. You know, um, the McLuhan tradition. Uh, well, one of the major things that Marshall did. Um, was insist on looking at the effect of the technology rather than the effect of the content. Um, you know, he basically put the content to the side and said, you know, what effect does the technology have as an environment of services and disservices and side effects? Um, you know, let's, this was actually something he learned back in Cambridge University for studying poetry. You know, there was a project by I.A. Richards and F.R. Levis called Practical Criticism. And what they did was they took a whole bunch of poems and they took the names off them and wanted to evaluate the merits of the poems, you know, what the poems themselves did. And it turns out that uh, <laughs> when you take the names off it, people don't know whether it's any good or not. And they can't agree on, on what makes a good piece of art or not. Um, and Marshall learned a lot from that, and that's kind of how he looked at technology. He took away the content and looked at the effect of the form. That's one major thing that distinguishes, uh, I think, McLuhan studies from, from other things, like media literacy, for example. Media literacy is, is the more popular uh, thing right now. And it's... Um, you know, it's it's not that content is unimportant or doesn't have an effect. Media literacy um, gets you to look and understand that the people behind technologies have biases and views and ideologies they're trying to persuade you of. And that's, that's true, and you should pay attention to that. But um, the main effects from technology don't come from there. They come from how society, how we are reshaped on an individual level cognitively and sensorily um, as a result of exposure and use of the technology, never mind really what we're using it for, um, and how that, you know, branches out into creating a, a new society in a new world, really, at this point, um, which is much different depending on 
if we have this technology or if we don't have this technology. So really, um, you know, if you were to ask somebody else what McLuhan studies is, you might get a different answer. Um, I have to kind of <laughs> go with with what I've managed to figure out uh, and and put that forward. There's probably other people, well, I imagine anybody else would do this differently, but, um, you know, I guess I follow my heart. Mm. Well, and, and it is interesting because the the real transition I've noticed from reading a lot of your grandfather's work and listening to his lectures was the emphasis on the the, the technology, the medium being the message more so than the content. And now it seems today everything is about content. I mean, yeah. even the word content creator will make some people cringe if you tell them that that's what they do. Yeah. Um, a, a colleague of mine, a co-host of mine for a show I do, you know, his whole thing is called the content corner. Um, oh. And I, I've noticed that that has been a transition from us as, you know, people say millennials and, and younger, where we just sort of take this technology for granted and we're more focused about what is the message inside of the content or, you know, inside of the medium, what, what is the content trying to tell us? And yeah. I, for me, I, you know, I, I was born at the end of 1995. I grew up with, you know, the internet and witnessing the transformation of a pre-smartphone, post-smartphone social media era and to where, you know, generational generations aren't really mattered anymore by birth year. It's about what kind of technology you grew up with as a kid mm -hmm. and how that affects your own understanding of the world. I'm, I'm not on TikTok, for instance, and I find younger people who are totally alien to me. I don't understand them. And uh, from, from your perspective, because you've talked about a lot of the, the word content on your, on your timeline on Twitter, which I, I greatly appreciate, uh, you know, do you, have you noticed a, maybe a reason or a particular, I guess, shelling point where it stopped being so much about the medium itself, but rather the, the content or the message inside? It's never been about the medium itself. Uh, it is yet to be about the medium itself. We're still so obsessed with content. Mm. Um, and there, there are complex reasons for that, uh, which I get. Um it's fear, you know, uh, there's one McLuhan quote where he says, uh, there's a, a repugnance in the human breast against understanding the processes in which he is involved. It's, I think, um, I think it's kind of Promethean, uh, if that's the right way to use that word. But I think we have um, a, a very instinctual fear, like our fear of fire um, against understanding deeply these things uh there's an instinctual reason and i think there are very practical reasons um on the part of companies and governments uh nobody likes to apologize or admit responsibility because that entails redress and doing something about it uh and that's a very <laughs> frightening concept for people who uh you know make a lot of money uh, and are afraid to, you know, lose any of that revenue. So I, I get it. Um, and again, content, uh, content is cool. I love content, you know, uh, I love music. I love books. Uh, I love writing poetry. I love reading poetry. Content's cool. You know, it's one of the cool things about humans is, uh, the stuff that we, we make and how we express ourselves. But, when it comes to the way uh, we are changed, it's less about content. You know, in um, Marshall paraphrased T.S. Eliot in Understanding Media when he said that content is like the juicy piece of meat used to distract the watchdog of the mind. Um, you know, and this quote from T.S. Eliot is actually about meaning in a poem. He had said that meaning is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind while the uh, while the poem does its work. And, you know, that tripped me up for a long time because, um, you know, I, I take things at face value. So what does that even mean? You know, what is being, what bur what is being burgled? What is being stolen? What, what, it, what work is the poem is the medium 
doing on you. And uh, what it's doing is it's it's rearranging uh, your sensibilities, your senses, your neural pathways, the way you think. All that all that happens while you're uh, distracted or absorbed by the content. It's like if you think about it um, in, in your own body, there's so much happening right now, so much that you're doing that you don't even realize, like breathing, like the blood circulating through your system, like your hair growing or falling out in my case, or your fingernails or whatever else, right? Like 90% of what's happening of what we're doing right now is, you know, another thing Marshall said is that everybody experiences far more than they understand, you know, or are even aware of. Uh, a lot happens beneath our notice. Um, and that's because if we spent our waking moments paying attention to our breathing and regulating our blood flow and all these other things, we we wouldn't have any time to think about anything else um, or get anything done, right? So there, there are very practical reasons why we don't pay attention to a lot of things. Um, these things happen in the background. But when, when it comes to, to technologies, um, they have very, very profound effects and uh, our, our not paying attention to them um, means that we have zero control over them. Um, and there was a time when we could we could afford to have less control. Um, you know, in the past, hundreds and hundreds of years ago now, um, change happens so slowly that we were able to adjust. Uh, you know, today, uh, you know, it takes minutes for technologies to go around the world. Whereas, you know, when the printing press was new, you know, it took a, it took a century, a few centuries for the printing press to catch on and become global. Now it takes, it's overnight, uh, GPT-4 has millions of active daily users, right? Um, Marshall also in, in 64 brought up Bertrand Russell, who said, if we only raise the temperature of the bathwater half a degree every hour, we wouldn't know when to scream. Right? It's like, if, you, if you're sitting in the bath and you just very, very slowly increase the, the temperature, you can get up to a really hot bath without being very uncomfortable. But if you were to try and get in that bath at that temperature from the cold, like you would burn yourself. And that's, that's where we are with technology today. It happens uh, too fast for us to begin to adjust and cope. And so we just feel the effects of it. And the effects of it are, are not, not very good, I think we're discovering. I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. There's, a, for instance, there's a friend of mine in, in South Africa, and he was telling me one time he was in... Um, I think it was Johannesburg for, for business. And he being um, Afrikaans, he, he just saw someone across the way that looked exactly like him, you know, thought that, you know, he probably has a very similar story of ancestry and a family history like himself. And that, that gentleman was on the phone speaking very perfect Americanized English. And how, and I, I've noticed that sort of thing living abroad as well, because my, my father was in the military I remember when we moved to, to Germany in the early 2000s, my, my father jokingly had said, you know, oh, the, a lot of the, the dress and the culture and the music for Germany is like it's the American 1980s. And of course, being a young kid, I really couldn't comprehend what he meant by that. And this, of course, is before smartphones or social media. And now uh, to see sort of ground zero being here in the United States, where all this culture and technology is exported, I, I feel as if, and maybe you have some thoughts on this based off your own understanding as well as Marshall's work, that we're sort of experiencing a, a Colombian exchange of sorts, mm -hmm. but what is being exported is something that you and I might have a, a stronger immune response to compared to the rest of the world. Because, I mean, the lingua franca, you know, of the internet is still, you know, American style English and the culture that comes with that. And so, you know, the, the technology that we have can transmit very cultural centered content to where, you know, American politics, as schizophrenic as they are, are now everywhere on a, on a global scale. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I grew up, uh, I was born in 1978. So, uh, I grew up with, with hip hop and, you know, punk rock and stuff. And, uh, grew up before the well before the internet um hip-hop is really interesting to me because they they have an innate understanding of the impact of technology and culture because they talk about the culture uh which is really interesting because they realize that hip-hop isn't just a musical form but it has it's an entire culture um and it's a global culture as maybe the first well it's it's the big modern global culture the interesting thing about it uh well one of the interesting things about it to me is how so i live i don't even live in town i live between farms in a rural area in southern ontario and you you have these guys like hardcore hip hoppers in Picton, which is the big town near me, who, um, you know, act like they're from South Central Los Angeles or something, right? Or from, you know, Brooklyn or Queens. Um, and obviously they aren't, but they feel they are part of that culture in very deep, uh, you know, fundamental ways. Um, and that is, that is new, uh, and it's a metaphysical difference, a fundamental difference. And they might not be from South Central LA or Brooklyn, but they are as much a part of that culture as somebody from South Central or from Brooklyn because of the nature of the technology, which we all participate in, which, you know, has such deep implications to us that it affects uh, our identity uh, to pathological degrees. And they might not be a black person from, you know, so central LA, but for all intents and purposes, they are part of that culture for all, in all the ways that matter. Um, that is very, that is a very new thing. Uh, it's a, it's a very curious thing that, that seems to happen when, you know, I've been looking more and more and more as what we're doing here as an out of body experience. Uh, I think that's a very useful way to think about it because, um, you know, in times gone by for most of human history, our body was a determining factor. Um, we could only have an impact on people through our physical presence, you know, to, to communicate, you had to be within hearing distance or seeing distance, I guess, you know, but, uh, with physical distance matter. And for the last, uh, well, kind of written communication through that out the window, but, um, certainly electricity put that, uh, a light year ahead. And the body is no longer the determining factor because I can transcend space and even time uh, because we don't know when people are going to listen to this. Um, and significant parts of me are, are not just here where I am right now, but they're also where you are and wherever whoever is listening or watching this might be. Um, and that might sound superficially interesting to some people but uh it is significant in terms of our identities um and we're seeing the effects of that um all around us as uh bodily identity identity is now uh open to all kinds of interesting interpretations in terms of what it means yeah there's a lot to there's a lot of places that we could go into that um a few uh, yeah a few <laughs> uh i i like the the description of it being an audio out of body experience in part mm -hmm. because prior prior to 
reading a lot of uh, Marshall's work and listening to his lectures, I had always associated sort of the online presence or just sort of the videos and the ecosystem itself to be uh, sort of a, a, an extra dimensional space, uh, mm. a, a, a sort of a, um, a plane you would go to. Cause I, I treat the, the digital space. I, I treat it. It has like drug like qualities, but it's also a, a non geographic geographic location. Uh, it's not a physical entity where I can go somewhere. Like I could drive some distance and I could be, you know, outside of Fort Worth hanging out with somebody, but instead I can be in this, you know, physical, non-physical location, talking to people mm -hmm. online all over the world. And uh, I've always just called it, you know, I, my, my cringe term for it was digital ayahuasca. And then I was reading a lot of Marshall's work and I was like, wow, I wish I read this sooner before I thought I was coming up with something so unique and original. But yeah. it, it has this, we, we, we consume this drug to go to a place and then, you know, talk with other people who were on their, their own form of this trip, this journey. And, uh, you know, you are the, the discussion about the, the, the degrees and how fast we would react to it. I mean, the earliest reactions to, you know, the phonograph or the phonograph recordings was is that, you know, we, we are listening to people who we, like it was, you know, a, a Jesuit priest had remarked that it was more or less just a tool of Satan. And now we sort of take it for granted that we have decades of historical audio and historical footage i mean yeah. no one pauses to consider that the laugh tracks on sitcoms are are the laughter and clapping of people who have been long dead and <laughs> we all just take it for granted right and uh, that is something i think that has been a, a weird adjustment to to consider that we there's no there's no room for reflexivity it is all just the the pleasure of convenience yeah and you know that's uh that's very apt now imagine that you spent uh 12 hours or more a day on ayahuasca you know <laughs> what what would that do to you the wild thing is that um you know the average american person now between the age of 8 and 18 spends um 12 to 15 hours a day on screens for non-educational purposes is how they frame it mm -hmm. non-educational and this again tells you about the content bias because as long as it's for educational purposes then that's good content you know that's okay and i was like well no it, it doesn't matter if you spend 18 hours a day watching national geographic or pbs or whether you spend 18 hours a day playing, for, uh, I'm making broad distinction or whatever, but, uh, you know, the content is not really the determining factor here. Uh, and, you know, you may have seen, I've, I've a few times asked on Twitter um, if anybody knows any legit shamans from traditional uh, lineage, because um, it occurred to me a while ago you know, you mentioned ayahuasca, is that we have actually people in our society who have uh, millennia deep traditions of out of body experiences uh, and traveling to the spirit world and back. Uh, and presumably, these people have, um, as part of their tradition, developed coping mechanisms and safety standards guidelines you know ways of doing these things to minimize the harm um and i i think that those people might have a lot to teach us um about how to maybe uh minimize harm to ourselves retain parts of our identity maybe i'm completely wrong about that i'm prob i could be very wrong about that um i also will probably never know because um any legit shaman is unlikely to see my tweet you know huh. yeah. um, but maybe somebody who knows somebody uh anyway it's an interesting in this line of work um you know it's all about exploration and uh it's new territory so you know you check out that river maybe there's something up that river Maybe there's not, it's a dead end. You go back and you try another river, you know? Um, there's, 
not really uh it's all exploration so that's just one uh one little avenue i've been trying to find uh to maybe find some coping strategies mechanisms i i can i can relate i mean my 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 priest is not on twitter so trying to explain to him that quite a few young people are part of a world where basically they're and maybe just to use more christian language just that i i jokingly say like yeah i i travel to other worldly places that i probably shouldn't be and i can go on twitter.com and i can see you know possessed people or dehumanized people all the time that have debased themselves or stripped their humanity of it and talk about how often they don't shower or inviting people to uh orgies and things like that and it's just you know there's no on one hand you know you follow the people that follow these people so that's a that's an indictment on your own end but also that uh we we make these individuals out to be um spectacles out of themselves and we we enjoy talking about the spectacle more sometimes than we do anything else and that kind of reminds me of uh you know Guy Debord's you know society of spectacle or we're so in, in nowadays I mean we're so focused on the content or what gets passed around as discourse on the Twitter timeline all the time. I mean, just to, mm. to, to date this recording, I mean, a, a couple of weeks ago, the big flash in the pan moment was a, a viral thread talking about, you know, Paul Verhoeven's uh, late 1990s film, Starship Troopers, and why it was awful satire, but a great piece of art. <laughs> and it was... It was just uh, terrible in a lot of ways, but also, I mean, if you're if you engage in the political side of things, then it was just easy gobble it up content for your clicks and your likes. And uh, I don't think that there are a lot of coping mechanisms out there. I mean, uh, I, I read, of course, a lot of um, you know a lot of patristic works. So, I mean, for instance, uh, anything on prayer, I, I I go towards immediately because. I, this is a great way to distract you and live very discarnately, um, you know, in, in understanding media, the, the phrase Marshall uses about auto amputation, we can cut ourselves off, or we have this feeling of being, you know, shaken out of our skin. Well, you know, I, I don't live in my skin when I'm online, I take on this amphibious persona, which I try to be as authentic as I can, but you're still kind of wearing a mask. And I don't think as you had pointed out, not too many people have come up with a, a successful strategy on how to balance those two worlds of mm -hmm. the the medium and the content, but then also real life. And the the reason why I wish I knew about like the auto amputation discussion and, and ideas that he was getting into is because I I I view things as in terms of being deracinated or, or deterritorialized, wherein I, I go online, I look for interesting people, and then I'm slowly but surely uprooting my language, my cultural background, and it becomes very easy to become a new person to a point where even non-political actors or even people that make, you know, educational or lecture style videos will call people out saying that your entire personality is based on an algorithm in terms of what you consume. And I mean, that's blatantly obvious. I think uh, even if you consume, uh, you know, National Geographic or you're really interested in military history or poetry, you can watch your algorithm on YouTube or Facebook or any other form of social media, try and steer you in that direction where that becomes your sole thing. Because mm -hmm. it wants to feed you what you're into, but also that you're kind of losing track of maybe why you got on in the first place. And the, the question I wanted to ask you is, is that there are some people online that I know, um, and I'm sure that this argument's been made by some of the people you follow, has just that you're, this is the great filter. You're, you're either going to adapt to it and live in this world, or you're going to, to fade away into, a, I guess, the, the heap of discursive or technological history. Uh, do, do you see that filter happening now in real time? Do you think that we haven't seen the worst of it yet? Or, or where, where do you see maybe the future of our, our content obsessed lives going from here? Well, I mean, again, the interesting thing for me is that um, paradoxically, 
content is the delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, content is kind of the spoon full of sugar that makes the medicine go down. Um, it's actually the means by which the changes uh, are delivered to us. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the butts in seats or eyeballs on screen. Uh, it's the way that we're, uh, our attention is occupied and monetized for whatever aims. And again, this is kind of media literacy. You know, people have uh, financial or economic or political or ideological reasons for engaging our attention uh, and attracting and holding it. Um, again, I'm very interested in um, what to do about any of this. Uh, I, I, I produced a work, I guess a couple of work years ago now called Maelstrom Escape Strategies. Um, and this is in response to uh, Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote this story, A Descent into the Maelstrom. And in this, it's a short story, and I encourage everybody to check it out. Um, it's a great, Marshall used it as an allegory to our relationship with technology, where, um, you know, and he used it as early as 1951 in The Mechanical Bride. Um, and, you know, some of the last things he he did he would he would bring up the descent into the maelstrom and um in the story there's a long story a short story shorter a sailor gets caught in this giant vortex in the ocean uh and the ship is going down and down and because the vortex is so huge it takes a long time to get around and around and after his initial terror wears off he starts to pay attention to what's going on around him and he realizes that while well, you know he and things are going down 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 ever faster and narrower um certain objects are actually going up and out um and he studies them and he thinks he sees a pattern there and he straps himself to an object and times it right and jumps overboard uh, and just as the boat goes down into the final depth he ends up going up and surviving and marshall believed that we're in a similar situation that we're involved in a in a vortex of innovation uh and we're going down 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 but he he was certain that by uh studying the processes with which we are involved that strategies of escape are possible and so i took this literally and i thought okay so how do we do that then because uh marshall didn't really um, you know, Marshall was big on uh, provoking us to find our own answers, not so much into providing them himself, uh, although he does if you look for them. You just you have to really read between the lines. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our, our job. Um, and so I, I brought it down to three things, uh, survive, escape, and avoid. So the first thing when you're in a vortex is you need to survive. Right. So you need to figure out a way to, to stabilize your situation uh, and then escape, get out of it. And then the, the third and probably critical part is not to leap into the next shiny vortex that comes along, right? So survive, escape, and avoid. And um, as far as the avoidance part is, uh, again, we're distracted by this, by this content like TikTok these short catchy videos or whatever we know that that's not good for us right we know that that's not a great way to spend our time um but people spend hours and hours and hours and hours on it right and going down and down and down that spiral and being changed as a result um so you know you know better so do better really is what it comes down to um but there are the easiest thing to do would probably be to take your smartphone and, and throw it in the lake. Um, however, who can do that? Not very many people, billionaires maybe, can get rid of their smartphone and go 
into a digital detox in Hawaii or some unnamed paradise and, you know, unplug. Most people can't afford to do that. Um, there's a reason why these things are ubiquitous is because, you know, they're how we get along in the world. Uh, I run I run this uh, little workshop that I do for kids. And it's, uh, you know, at the end of it, I basically pose the question, what if you wake up tomorrow and your smartphone doesn't work? And neither do your friends. And they're never going to work again. And the horror, the horror, because they can't imagine doing anything. You know, it it puts them to sleep at night. It wakes them up in the morning. They check TikTok and whatever else and communicate with their friends, all based on this thing. And they can't imagine life without it. Um, so it's a very simplistic and unrealistic thing to just say, well, you know, just get rid of your smartphone and and that's the answer, right? It's mm -hmm. not practical. But what can we do? And there are there are some things that I think we all can do to um, to help us out a little bit. Um, one of them is, well, what I try to do, I try to balance, it's a losing battle, uh, but I try to balance my screen time with book time, you know, and I never, on a daily basis, I never do it because I spend, you know, we've been talking for almost an hour already and I haven't read my book for an hour today. You know, I had a two hour meeting before this and, you know, I've got an essay to type later. Um, it's going to be six, eight hours of screen before I'm done today. And there's no way I'm getting six hours of book time in there. But what I, what I try to do is, is balance these times because I understand, uh, and you should understand that spending an hour looking at a screen and spending an hour looking at a page have completely different effects on you physiologically. So for one thing, when you, when you look at a screen, you've actually got the light coming through uh, and shining on you. And that's a fundamental difference uh, when you're looking at a page where the light reflects off it, okay? Um, this is why it drives me crazy when teachers are trying to teach kids how to read and assigning them reading on screens. It's like you don't understand the basic difference in technical difference between these media, right? The medium of the page versus the screen. Um, one basic difference is that when the eye looks at a page of text on a screen, it behaves differently than when the eye looks like a printed page. Uh, your eye tends to skim and skip uh, on a screen and tends to focus more on, on a page. And part of that has to do with the fonts that are used uh, serif fonts, the ones with the little curlies at the end, tend to hold the eye more, and you tend to see them more on printed pages than sans serif fonts like Arial or Helvetica, which you normally see on a screen because they work better. Um, but they, they, the way that your eye interacts with them is different. Um, so there's one fundamental difference. Um, so one thing I recommend to people is that when you have the option, read on paper um, for the physiological differences. Uh, writing is another way. So I can type about 80 words a minute on a keyboard, uh, my computer keyboard, whereas I, I write about 40 words a minute, uh, pen and paper or pencil and paper. And that may seem like a trivial difference, but uh, but it's not. Because one of the main uh, effects of our time is a heightened sense of anxiety. And a lot of that anxiety um, comes because we can't cope, because there's so much coming at us. Our minds are going a million miles an hour, and uh, our bodies can't keep up. Anxiety, it's, it's kind of a per perpetual PTSD, technologically induced. Well, um, this is one way to slow down your mind a little bit it's because if you if you spend uh in order to write by hand something that makes any logical sense your mind has to slow down um, otherwise uh, you're just going to write nonsense mm -hmm. so one thing i suggest to people if they want to reduce their anxiety a little bit 
and anybody can do this. Even if you're a single parent, um, you can find 15 minutes at the beginning or the end of the day to do this and write a page. You know, write a letter, write a note to yourself, write a memory, write a letter to your child, whatever. But um, slowing the hand slows the mind and that produces a kind of anti-anxiety effect. And when you, if you do this, uh, you know, five plus days a week, um, for a few weeks, you'll notice a difference. I guarantee you, because I've had people do it and they've told me that they notice a difference. So I'm constantly looking for things like this. I call them maelstrom escape strategies, little things that you can do in order to um, take a more active role in your life. And is it is it perfect? No. Um, the alternative uh, is to do what some Amish, you know, societies do and just ban technologies. And hey, it's crude, but it's effective too. Mm. Um, they understand that uh, culture uh, and technology are intertwined. And you can't change technology and not expect to change culture. Um, so, you know, this is the terms of service that you don't see. It's like use of this technology is going to make your culture untenable. But it is. Uh, in the United States, you have a, a society based on uh, the physical presence and speed of paper, uh, of mail and printed printed works, um, which no longer makes any any sense. You know, the institutions and the government and the constitution are literally printed and based on the speed of print. You know, you you appoint a guy to go to Washington for you because you can't go to Washington and it takes weeks for letters to get back and forth. So, hey, let's send Jack or Jill or whatever over to Washington to make the decisions for us because we can't be there. Well, now we can, for all intents and purposes, make a lot of those decisions from home. We don't really need to send that guy to Washington to do all that stuff anymore. If you were to found the United States today, it would look entirely different because the practical circumstances are very different under electric conditions or digital or now AI conditions than they were under print conditions. Uh, and there's an enormous dissonance which is occurring because we have a change in structure uh, a change in foundation, and we're trying to keep that structure, uh, you know, stable while the foundation's been replaced. Um, and a lot of the problems that we're having, I think, come down to that kind of structural dissonance um, interiorly between ourselves, our, our own bodies and minds and sensory systems, and uh, socially in our social structures and institutions. Your, uh, your your discussions on sort of these escape strategies. I, I'm just curious if you are if you're if you follow a lot of the AI discussion, or do you see yourself maybe agreeing with a more extreme position like um, Eliezer Yudikowsky about banning this kind of technology or trying to stop the um, proliferation of high and advanced uh, artificial intelligence or large language models. Um, it's hard to know what to do. I mean, it seems to me crazy to introduce these things into our societies without knowing what's going to happen, because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, could anybody have predicted what society looks like today with the internet when the internet began? No, not at all. They thought it was going to do um, make the world, you know, a happy place and we can all get along and share um, reliable information and all the rest of it, right? And it's like, well, a little more happened and it's the side effects that get us. It's like, I've talked about this before, but maybe people listening to this won't have heard those discussions. But um, I, I look at, for example, the creation of the FDA in the United States. And it's not a perfect analogy, but uh, it's not imper. It's, you know, it goes a long way. And before 
you know, in the early 20th century, before the Food and Drug Safety Act, or the creation of the Food and Drug Administration, um, drug companies and food and beverage companies basically self-regulated. What happened was uh, people in the U.S., in the Midwest or something, were getting sick and dying from tin tainted meat, uh, canned meat. Um, and they they demanded uh, government step in and, and regulate. And the Food and Drug Safety Act came out, which said that food and drugs had, uh, there were two main criteria that they had to be safe and effective. So, uh, you know, not make you sick or kill you and effective. They had to do what they said they were going to do. So no more snake oil. And the drug companies, uh, you can imagine, were not keen on this idea. It's like, well, you know, we have, that wouldn't be profitable to to kill our customers. You can trust us to to do the right thing, right? Nobody wants regulation. Uh, the amount of hoops that drug companies have to go through to get a new product to market are crazy, right? It takes years and millions, if not billions, of dollars to get a major drug to because they have to go through a series of cascading trials. Uh, you know, animal trials and testing progressively before they can even get to human trials before they can, you know, release a product. But um, we wouldn't imagine letting a drug company, well, we could go other places, but generally, <laughs> you know, right. Generally, most people agree that the FDA and the Food and Drug Safety Act is a good thing and a necessary thing. Um, and the thing about it is, is Pfizer or Bayer or anybody else uh, are not hurting for profits. You know, <laughs> they've they've made their money regardless. Um, but we realize that, uh, you know, it's important to have safeguards in place so that we have, uh, we protect ourselves and we have an expectation of what we're going to do. You know, you see an ad for a drug for a drug on TV or whatever. And you've got like this, uh, this company, this couple hand in hand walking through the surf, right? And it's a beautiful sunny day and birds soaring overhead and they're having the time of their lives. And then in the background, this guy is going like rapid fire about all the evil yeah. stuff that's going to happen to you. <laughs> if you take this drug, you know, your bowels could start bleeding and blah, blah, blah right? Mm -hmm. The side effects. Um. And we wouldn't dream of uh, allowing, okay, again, this stuff has gone a little sideways in the last couple of years, but generally we wouldn't let a drug company just release a new drug without doing any testing. Yet this is what we do uh, for technologies. We, uh, we know better. We know that any new technology is going to have wide side effects personally uh, and socially. And yet we do not hold any companies uh, to account for them. Uh, maybe because we think that they're unforeseen or Im impossible to know what the side effects will be. But that's not the case. Um, through my family's work, and not just my family's work, but other, other people looking into the effects of technologies, we have a lot of different ways for anticipating the effects of technologies both the intended consequences and the unintended consequences. But, uh, you know, nobody wants to delay their product getting to market. Uh, Apple, Microsoft, any of these companies fight. Long. They're happy to go to these Senate hearings all day long because none of that, it's all about content. And none of it has anything to do uh, very much to do with what actually happens as a result of introducing these technologies to the world. One of the things that I do see that has been a really large side effect has been, for instance, the perception of time. Mm. Um, you know, a, a, a thousand years, this is a watch in the night as to yesterday, as the psalmist would say, but also that uh, for us, our, our our social understanding, our online perception of time is warped in comparison to reality. And 
uh, I like to to reference a, a thumbnail from a video from 2017 about some flashpoint in culture war politics. And 2017 was seven years ago. But if you're terminally online, so to speak, you know, that, that was 7,000 years ago for all intents and purposes. Um, and the perception of time is something that uh, Marshall talks about in his chapter on clocks and understanding media. Uh, and you mentioned Harold Innes earlier, who talks about the bias of time and communication. D do you know how much of an influence um, Dr. Innes had on, on Marshall's work uh, and his understanding of communication and time? Yeah, um, it's interesting. It's too bad. Uh, Harold Innes died even younger than Marshall did. Uh, they both taught at the University of Toronto. Um but they didn't really have uh, a lot to do with each other. Uh, Marshall found out that um, Innes was uh, teaching or recommending his book, The Mechanical Bride. And that's what brought Innes to his attention. He hadn't heard about him before that. Because um, Innes was uh, an economic historian. Uh, it's, it's interesting, actually, uh, because they're, they're kind of two Inneses. There's the economics guy and there's the media guy. And uh, people are, are generally interested in one or the other sides and few are interested in both. Uh, and usually both camps aren't interested in each other. Um, a lot of the economic history people are kind of embarrassed by uh, the communication stuff. But um, Marshall uh, said that his work was a, a footnote to Innes. Mm. Um, and Innes's work on material uh, media and how it shapes society, papyrus, stone, uh, transportation by canoe or by road, um, were fundamental in uh, his understanding uh, of the way technology reshapes society less by its content than by its form. Um, he actually wrote an introduction to a 1960-something uh, version of The Bias of Communication, which is worth reading. It's where he said his, his work is a footnote to Innes. Um, but just like Innes has maybe two camps, McLuhan has, has at least two camps, because uh, Marshall also characterized, characterized his work as applied Joyce, as in James Joyce. Mm. And uh, although Marshall McLuhan cites a lot of people's work uh, over his uh, works, no one is is cited more than James Joyce uh, by Marshall, and no work is cited more than Finnegan's Wake. And people don't know what to do about that, because I don't know if you've ever looked at Finnegan's Wake, but it's not easy reading. No, uh, to say the least. You thought McLuhan was hard to read. Try Finnegan's Wake. Um, but Marshall quite seriously said that his work is applied Joyce. And he said that, you know, no sooner had I discovered something about media that I'd go to Finnegan's Wake and find that Joyce had been there first. Joyce called himself the greatest inventor, uh, engineer of the 20th century. And Marshall McLuhan agreed. He said nobody understood media the way uh, Joyce did. And a lot of what Marshall McLuhan did was really um, take further the work of other people, uh, be that Innes, be that uh, Joyce, or Aristotle, or Aquinas, or any of these other figures. Marshall's uh, particular genius was connecting things that other people didn't connect, like um, taking the techniques for uh, literary criticism and applying them to technology and culture. And I, well, I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad to know that he had, he had written a, a sort of a, a, an introduction to that text because uh, I know that someone had forwarded you my discussion with a, a gentleman named Dimes talking about those two men. And, uh, yeah. you know, as, as I was telling people that I, I've been reading a lot more of um, Marshall's work, they tell me, well, you got to read Innes first. You know, if you want to understand him, you need to read you need to read Innes. And so I have and I have a greater appreciation for both, which is 
Hmm. It's funny to know that there are two camps for him because I feel like Empire least... em, Empire and Communications is the perfect oh. synchronicity between the economic historian in us and media in us, in, in my mm -hmm. perspective, at least reading the text. Um, but actually, you, you had mentioned, um, of course, uh, Joyce, Aristotle, uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you know, Marshall was, a, from how I read him and how he had talked about things, both in understanding media and in his lectures, he seemed to be a very devout Catholic. And I, I was curious as to how much of his Catholicism was an influence on his work. Well, this is... Uh... This is an interesting topic. And again, you've got kind of divided opinion on it too. There's some people that say, you know, you can't separate McClure and the Catholic uh, from his work on technology. And I don't think you, I don't think you can um, any more than you can separate parts of people's personality from each other. You know, we're all whole organisms. Uh, however, uh, I'm not sure that uh, you know, if you're atheist, you can find no value in McLuhan because he was a Catholic or came things. I think, I think the main, the main influence of his Christianity on his technology work is just that he had a very strong sense of, of, uh, hope and optimism, uh, and salvation, uh, which, maybe turned him from a, a doomer into a techno optimist funny as it is to say that you know um and, and i continue that i feel a lot of hope myself because uh we humans are are incredible uh we but i i believe that um we don't engineer ourselves into any mess that we can't engineer ourselves out of. Uh, when presented with a challenge, we tend to to figure out a way, you know? Um, I think we need to get a lot smarter about it because um, our decisions have greater consequences than they ever have, uh, both in scope and scale and speed. And so... Um, you know, there's no going back. Uh, we, we can't go back to a pre-internet society uh, except by very, very drastic measures. And look, um, it's not a, uh, not a pretty picture to imagine. Think about what would happen if the electricity went off for a month or two months or a year. Like things would get pretty medieval pretty quickly. Uh, and it would not be a good a good scene. Um, I think we really need to do to do, to do better. But um, to the point, we can. Uh, there's there's no good reason why we don't try to do better. Um, there there are lots of bad reasons. The main one being that people optimize technology for. Uh, I think the silliest things, the stupidest things like attention and, you know, shareholder uh, benefits and wealth and that kind of thing. And that's um, really not had great results. Uh, I think we probably need to revisit why, uh, why we do these things and maybe do them differently. Um, but, you know, back not to dodge your question about, uh, Catholicism or Christianity. It, it's very important in understanding um, what motivated Marshall and uh, how his his worldview. Um, but uh, there are other, other ways to look at it as well. For example, um, people have made uh, a bit of a fuss about the fact that he went to church, went to mass every day. Um, well, he, he really did uh, because it was convenient to um, where his office was at the University of Toronto. Oh, there's there's my cat Barry. Um, <laughs> there was a, a cathedral at the end of the street, so it would uh, and they had a noon mass, and uh, you know the noon mass is shorter than the the Sunday mass. They usually get it done in like half an hour, so he could do that, and so he did. 
because he enjoyed going to mass and uh, you know felt the benefit of it as a medium. Um, people also make uh, a deal that uh, he read his Bible every day. Um, he started off his day reading his Bible, but uh, not like you or I do. He um, he had Bibles in uh, in dozens of languages. And he didn't just read the Bible in English, but he read it in Spanish, in Italian, in French, in Portuguese, or whatever else. Um, and whenever he traveled, uh, he would pick up the, the Bible from the nightstand if he didn't have one in that language um, for very practical reasons, because uh, the people who translate Bibles are f fanatic about consistency, right? Uh, so it makes it a, a really great control uh, for learning a language because you can be pretty sure that that translation is going to be even across across languages. And Marshall understood, speaking of the bias of communication, that um, you know your language is your limit, right? Uh, the words that we have, very much determine our understanding, our ability to understand or grasp or relate or explain or explore things. Uh, and we have uh, we have some words in English. We have words in German for which we don't have words in English. You know, there every different language is a different way of uh, a different mode of perception, a different mode of experience, different way of understanding and relating to things. Um, and the beauty of, of knowing different languages is having those different perspectives. And so this is why Marshall read uh, his Bible in so many different languages, was to break out of the spell of English. Uh, so that uh, he worked very, very hard to uh, not narrow his, his perspective, but to widen it. And, uh, you know, study of languages was, was one way to do that. Because he understood that um, the study of media is an environmental study. Uh, so you can't afford a single point of view. Um, single point of view will get you a single mode of understanding. And technology doesn't work on single planes. So I, I was going to save this as maybe my last question, but maybe we can uh, head towards the end. I know that you've got some limited time on this as well, but um, you know, many people consider Marshall to be a sort of secular prophet in, in regards to his observations on, on technology and on communications and media. Uh, so this will be a two-parter. Um, what do you think out of all the things that he may have observed or written or discussed what is the biggest thing that he got right? And maybe what is something that he got wrong? <laughs> I know that's an incredibly loaded question. Oh, but... that's, that's fine. All questions are loaded. That's a fun <laughs> one, at least. Um, you know, I think one of his major contributions to the study of media was to take it from simple communication study what I mean by that is, um, and we still haven't actually caught up to this. Um, he, one of his main contributions was in popularizing this word medium uh, and what it means. Because, uh, you know, and this is where it's, it's actually helpful and a way to get past the content obsession is if you look at understanding media, the list of chapters. It's not just telephone and television, although they're there. Uh, it's not just the. There you go. Yeah. It's uh, hey, I, was, I was I was prepping for for before. I got, a, I got a couple too. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not just communication technologies, but he also looks at housing, uh, clothing, games. Um. And these are not. Uh, these are not commonly thought of as media. You know, actually for most people, a medium is something that you plug in or has a battery, right? But uh, Marshall is understanding media, the extensions of man. So if you wanna know 
and it's a good thing to ask what Marshall meant by medium or media. And by the way, media is the plural of medium, not mediums. But anyway, uh, I've had to give up uh, and, and let go of, of the grammar <laughs> usage because <laughs> it gets tiresome. But And whatever, people can say what they want. But I'll say media. Um, he defined it as an extension of a man, of human. So medium is uh, anything that we produce um, to exceed our bodily abilities. So it's, um, you know, whether it's a, a telephone to, you know, allow us to speak across time and space or, uh, you know, a pen or paper or whatever else. But um, also a hammer, you know, also a gun, also clothing, you know, and housing uh, and heating and cooling. I actually like to, to use air conditioning or heat HVAC systems as an example, because here's a human technology which makes one kind of society possible and other kinds of society not possible. Um, it makes Florida uh, habitable um or not uh, it makes skyscrapers possible or not because you know you can't have windows that open on the 40th floor it's just not a good idea um, so you couldn't have a four-story building without uh, heating and air conditioning but we're not about to uh, start regulating the content of air conditioners you know so air conditioning or you know these other non-communication if you want to put it that way technologies are a great way to to start studying media as a category because uh, we don't get as bound up in is this good content or like is this a good use of air conditioning or a bad is this educational air conditioning or entertainment air conditioning you know um, the fact is that uh, air conditioning uh, produces this one society um, that is not possible without it, you know, or cars, you know, or super highways, you know, create suburbs. They destroy neighborhoods and the work life balance is a very different thing when you have cars and highways in suburbs than when you don't. Um, this is media. So, and understanding media. Um, and so I think that's one of Marshall McLuhan's great contributions to media studies uh, is bringing it out of simple communications and into the wider world of technology. Um, he got he got plenty wrong, but he was he was less interested in being right than I guess being interesting. <laughs> uh, he said, "You know, you don't like that idea. I got others." And he wasn't, he wasn't just being flip about it. Um, he was interested in progress. And um, argument isn't progress. You know, so he's like, okay, if that's not a useful idea to you, let's talk about something else. You know, let's move forward. Um, he wasn't so much interested in debate, uh, not because he was afraid to back up the things that he was saying, but um, that's not what interested him. He wasn't interested in debate. He was interested in knowledge and exploration. Uh, and, you know, time's too short to quibble over small stuff. So I'm, I'm dodging your question a little bit because, you know, what did he get wrong? I mean, look, he was a guy of his times. He was an English professor. He was, you know, a white male Catholic Christian, very traditional conservative guy. He got lots of stuff wrong in other people's eyes, um, and I'm I'm not sure uh, much of that matters beside uh, the things that he's helped us to understand. Mm -hmm. Where do you see? I guess this will be my last question for you then. Where do you see the future? Well, actually, no, two part question. Sorry, because I now I just you've, you've said some things that have just got me to think going. Um, do you think we'll ever get to a point where perhaps we're more focused on the medium 
or the technology itself rather than the content. Uh, you had said at the beginning of the interview that we we never really left the the content side yeah. um, because how I see it in, in based on political discussion here in America, there are certain mediums, or TikTok in an example, right, where, you know, Republicans and even some Democrats want to ban it for national security purposes because it's owned by the Chinese. And I mean, it's it's looking at it from a very specific lens of national security. Yeah. Um, but do, do you think that we're going to see a larger discussion in the future about the, the mediums themselves, I, I, I don't see, at least for me personally, because they're so convenient to use and everybody uses them, you can't force technological regression lest there be a, a collapse. You know, the things would get medieval. We can look to the, the New York blackouts in the 1970s. Yeah. But um, do, you, do you think that, uh, I guess, we in, in the West will ever have sort of a, a reflexive referendum or discussion about these things or are we going to just um paddle along this uh this colorado rapids and what come may it's uh i think it's possible um believe it or not i think uh banning tiktok is the right idea uh because they're not talking about banning uh propaganda tiktok mm -hmm. or they're not talking about banning like when they talk about banning books, they're not talking about banning books. They're talking about banning particular books and uh, banning particular books is not going to affect literacy. Banning particular TikTok channels is not going to uh, mitigate the effect of TikTok. It's just going to make, you know, certain propaganda difficult. So actually talking about banning TikTok, even if they don't understand the reason why, is actually uh, putting the medium as a message into practice because they understand uh, that even, okay, maybe, maybe they're thinking along the way, along the lines of, you know, Chinese propaganda or something like this. Um, one question I've been uh, kind of wrestling with, I'm writing a book about the medium is the message, and uh, kind of my concluding essay or chapter is titled, Will the Medium Always Be the Message? Mm. And um, the answer, I can only foresee one possible scenario, and it's kind of science fiction, where the medium is not the message. And the medium is the message relies on our ignorance of the medium and our inability to look at the structural effects of technologies. As long as we ignore the structural environmental effects, as long as we ignore how various technologies affect our senses and how when you affect our senses individually, you affect our sensorium uh, because you know, all our senses exist together in a balance and a ratio. One thing that people who become blind find out very quickly is just that, that when you shut off the visual faculty, your other faculties pay, uh, take notice. Your hearing becomes more acute. Your sense of touch becomes greater. Your other senses, because your senses exist in a balance and an equilibrium, and to affect one sense is to affect all the senses because they all kind of adjust. This, uh, you know, has great effects on us, including uh, our identities, because who you are as a person with vision is very different from who you are as a person without vision. You would not pick that tie to wear if you couldn't see the color of it. You might not even wear a tie. Oh, maybe you would, but you wouldn't have the art on your walls that you do. You know, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't paint your walls. Why would you, a crazy person would paint their walls if they couldn't see the color? Like what would be the point of that? Mm -hmm. right. So our identities are very wrapped, not only our, our notions of our identity, our perception of our identity, but our, our actual identity, you know, physical and metaphysical, very wrapped up in, in who we are at, at sensory systems. Technologies affect these senses individually, 
affect them together and basically shape who we are as people shape uh, our preferences our tastes um and everything flows downstream from that this creates societies um if we ever started to pay attention to the role of technology in shaping our senses and shaping our identities and societies then and you know accounted for that in technological development and adoption and progress that's the true regulation that would make any difference and then you know you might be able to say the medium is no longer the message hmm. my I, my last question would then be this is is that um i'm sure you've noticed this as well perhaps with um some of the other kids that maybe your kids interact with at school a lot of my friends are, are school teachers themselves and they've noticed sort of the rise of general illiteracy because the technology allows them to communicate regardless of being literate and that we've also you know there are numerous studies that talk about the use of emojis and things like that to help um, make communication more accessible or to understand the mood or intent of the speaker and it seems that we're in this either post-literate society or this maybe uh, what i guess maybe orientalized society to, and it's all fused together with our our literate word structures of the west do you see that perhaps as a just the next evolutionary step of our relationship to the mediums or do you see it perhaps as um a, a form of a dark age or a regression to a, an older kind of society well, um, you know, literacy seems to have been uh, a small blip or aberration in the human timeline. Um, we've been post-literate for decades, if not over a century at this point. Um, an emoji uh, isn't so much a, a cause of illiteracy as, as an effect of post-literacy. Um, because words are no longer enough. Uh, you know, I can't write an email anymore without, you know, 50 exclamation points uh, at the end of sentences so that I make sure you understand I'm enthusiastic about this, right? But, like, plain text is not enough for people anymore. Uh, emoji are, are a reaction to the fact that that words are not enough we're not able to not only can't we communicate what we want to but we aren't we can't be satisfied with um such a bare stripped down amount of information as in a word words are not enough you know we need we need more information uh and so we are we are effectively post-literate in terms of the role of literacy in society uh the role of of words and in, in the printed page and whatever else um it's it's no longer what runs things uh and i mean i was born in the post literate era so uh i can i don't know if if there's really you know literacy made made certain things possible uh you know age of reason and whatever else which um seems long gone at this point it also um was responsible for a lot of not so great stuff um you know separation and detachment and objectivity uh kind of go hand in hand um but it's nice to to love and and be loved and feel loved and express these things and be okay with emotion and connection and this kind of thing um so yeah i don't know uh one thing i'm interested in is is it possible to have uh you know the what we consider the good effects of literacy without uh, the less desirable effects of literacy is it possible to have them some other way uh without this extreme form of the alphabet and the printing press and all that 
Um, that's a really interesting question to me and love I'd, one I'd love to uh, pursue a bit more. Maybe I will get a chance to. Well, I, I certainly hope that you do. And I, I look forward to whenever you finish that text because I will be certainly purchasing a copy uh, for myself. Um, Andrew, where can people find the work that you do and what are you currently working on? Um, I have a website, the McLuhan Institute .com, uh, that my brother-in-law built and maintains for me. It's pretty basic and has links to, you know, I've got a YouTube channel and uh, the McLuhan Institute on Twitter is a pretty incredible resource. Uh, I've spent years putting some great McLuhan content up there. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I have a Substack newsletter. I try to get a post out every month. Uh, you can find the McLuhan newsletter on Substack. Um, at the moment, I'm making maple syrup because it's springtime in Ontario. So, uh, you know, I've got a couple trees tapped out there and I spend Sundays boiling sap into syrup, which is uh, my preferred form of alchemy. Uh, so yeah, keep tabs if you want to, uh, various places. And if you're in uh, Prince Edward County, come visit. Wonderful. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for, for coming on and uh, having this discussion slash interview. And thank you for uh, carrying on your, your grandfather's legacy. Thanks. Um, it's been nice to talk to you. Oh, there's, there's one more thing. Uh, you might even be interested. Uh, it looks like I'm going to do another round of this, uh, this course I do called Understanding Media Intensive. Um, and that, uh, to do it, what we do is we go through understanding media cover to cover, uh, where it's like, I basically read it out loud as an audio book and pause to chase down all the little rabbit holes that come up. So it's like to do the whole thing takes about 18 months of two or three hour classes every week. And you come out the other end for better or worse, a different person. So keep an eye out for that, I'll, I'll announce that on Twitter probably in the next week or two for details. Wonderful. Well, I will have your links down below in the description for when I put this up so people can find you and the work that you've done. And again, thank you so much for coming on and having this conversation with me. My pleasure. Take care. You too.